Um, I'm going to uh, start this Friday morning session. As you know, yesterday we were trying to find ways of making what we do uh, less invasive and aggressive. Today we're going to have a particular look at the ways in which we do things for cancer could perhaps be consolidated and reduced. Are there ways we can do less of a big operation as far as cancer is concerned? And there are various themes related to that. Um, to set the ball rolling, I'm going to introduce my very good friend and colleague, Mike Greenall. Mike Greenall is a surgical oncologist in Oxford, and he did a fellowship at Memorial Sloan Kettering years before it was fashionable to do anything like that. In fact, he wrote one of the seminal papers on uh, squamous carcinoma of the, uh, of the anus. Uh, he's been, if you like, struggling for his professional life with the whole issue of what lymph nodes mean and how you should, if you like, identify or, or, uh, or get to grips with them as far as breast cancer is concerned. And he's going to speak this morning on Halstead and the colorectum. Mike. <coughs> thank you very much, Neil, and uh, thank you for uh, talk here today. Um, this is a rather sort of gentle introduction after last night and thank you for a wonderful meal and all that went with it. Now more than a year ago I was uh, talking to Run, your course convener about nodes in general and the problems we had with them and um, both Ron and Neil have asked me again to talk this morning as a bit of a perhaps a preamble as to the subjects you're yourselves going to be talking about later on uh, to today. So, Holstead and the colorectum. Is there anything that is in breast cancer research that could be applicable to rectal cancer? Well, certainly, uh, surgeons that deal with rectal cancer and breast cancer do have certain ideals in treatment. The aims of treatment long-term survival without related morbidity, no physical disfigurement, no mastectomies, no stomas, ablate the potential for metastatic disease, ensure no local recurrence, which is a major problem for breast cancer and I know is a tragedy for rectal cancer patients, continually strive to improve results, and not to forget that in both disciplines nearly all the cure that is provided is provided by surgeons. Now there is a basic dilemma when it comes to trials in surgical oncology. And that is, if you trial an aggressive local therapy, be it surgical, radiotherapeutic, chemotherapeutic, or a combination, there's initially an tendency to show decreased recurrence rates, but little survival advantage. However, if you look at patients with local recurrence in isolation, you show that they have a worse prognosis. And indeed, the odds ratio of death after local recurrence to breast cancer is 1.6, for rectal cancer, 2.1. So this shows this dilemma where there is a lack of correlation between survival and local recurrence, but local recurrence patients do badly. Now, when it comes to looking at research in cancer, there are certain advantages <coughs> for breast disease. Firstly, we've had extensive randomized trials for the best part of 40 years, as I guess compared to about 20 years for yourselves. We have large numbers of patients to study. In the UK, there are about 50,000 cases of breast cancer a year, compared to 25 or 30,000 for colorectal. We have a young age group. The median age of presentation is about 57, 12 years younger than rectal cancer, so it means that we have a relatively young population to study into the longer term. Once you start looking at people in their 80s, you have so much comorbidity, the sensitivity of studies tends to fall off. We have ease of access to tissue. We have high sensitivity to multiple therapeutic treatments, radiotherapy, endocrines, monoclonals, and so forth. And of course, there's been a lot of finance put into breast cancer. Now, if you take the studies that we've done in general over the years, we found that initially, the interim results, the five-year results, <coughs> tended to demonstrate an impact on high-risk cases. So therefore, when we were applying aggressive surgical treatment or applying radiotherapy, chemotherapeutic protocols, initially we showed effects on patients with positive nodal disease and big cancers. And the reason for that is, is that the 
benefit of any intervention is a function of risk. And benefit is easily seen in high-risk cases. It's only when you have more cases in the longer term with better case definition that you begin to see things having an impact on lower risk cases. And I would imagine at the present time you're seeing most of your benefits and adjuvant treatments in Duke's B and C cancers, but it will be there for A cancers if you have long enough follow-up with better case definition. Meta-analysis has helped greatly in breast disease. The first surgical oncology meta-analysis in fact was on breast disease long ago as 1985 when at that time there was 40,000 patients with chemotherapy and 70,000 patients with endocrine therapy in a meta-analysis for breast <coughs> cancer. We've also identified surrogates for survival over this period of time. To set up a trial, to recruit, to treat, to follow up is a 10 to 15 year program at least. And absolute survival is a very difficult endpoint because it is so much in the future. Our studies have shown that you can use disease-free survival as a surrogate with great accuracy. But even better now, we've shown that it's possible to use time to first relapse <coughs> being a surrogate for survival. And indeed, the complete response rate if you're looking at chemotherapy and radiation protocols. And finally, and very importantly, many of our studies have not shown an effect for five years. However, at five years to ten years, they begin to show an effect. If they do, that effect then is continuing for 20 years. So you have to wait <coughs> a bit sometimes to show the benefit, but when the benefits are shown, they continue in the long run. Now, <coughs> here's a couple of mobile phones. The one on the left is from 1985. The one on the right is a G4 from 2011. Here are a couple of mini cars, 1985 up there on the left, the 2010 model down on the right. And certainly as far as uh, the motor industry is concerned, electronics and telecommunications have been huge advances in the last 25 years. I wish this was uh, so uh, for surgical oncology. I, as Neil was saying, was working at Sloan Kettering between 1983 and 1985. And in 1984, we had a two-day symposium, basically on what you're talking a bit about today, on the evaluation and importance of regional lymph nodes in the treatment of solid tumours. Now, regional lymph node surgery was part and parcel at Sloan Kettering, as you can imagine, big cancer centre, very good <coughs> surgeons, aggressive surgeons, and uh, they were very interested in this whole subject. <coughs> in fact, when you asked them, about what their main basis of information was concerning lymphadenectomy. They often quoted this paper, colorectal paper from the Cleveland Clinic, which I'm sure you all know about, uh, Rupert Turnbull and his non-touch technique, comparing that technique with the more standard resections done at the Cleveland Clinic at that time, and showing, in fact, an improvement in survival. At Sloan Kettering, this was regarded as a method as doing a rather radical lymphadenectomy in patients with colorectal disease. Well, at the time of that symposium, there were four <coughs> publications current in the press concerning regional lymphadenectomy for various cancers. And uh, this was done by three main surgeons in the institution, all very good technical surgeons and <coughs> all very good <coughs> surgical scientists. The most aggressive of the surgeons was Jerry Urban who was a breast disease surgeon, who gave, at that time, his 15-year results of extended radical mastectomy. Now, this was an operation which was a radical mastectomy involving removal of auxiliary lymph glands, <coughs> but he opened up the costochondral cartridges, took out the internal mammary nodes, and sometimes the mediastinal nodes. Warren Enke, you all know, was doing pelvic lymphadenectomy at that time for rectal cancer, and Joe Fortner, another very aggressive surgeon, was looking at block resection of the groin for limb melanoma and regional pancreatectomy for pancreas cancer. And at that time, although these were comparative studies, they were not randomized trials, there was no survival advantage to anybody in, this, uh, in these studies, apart from the fact that Warren Enka mm -hmm. showed a tendency to improvement in survival in Duke's B, rectal cancer, in, in women who had pelvic lymphadenectomy. 
When Enker actually published this data three or four years later, he did show overall survival advantages. <coughs> so at that time, although there were strivings to do very radical lymphatic nectarines, it was very difficult to show much of a benefit. Now where had this interest come from? The interest, of course, had come from William Holstead, as shown here. Up on the left, it shows Holstead as a young man, aged 35. He was a very successful surgeon in New York. <coughs> he did about a sixth cholecystectomy in the United States on his mother at home. <laughs> he, was <coughs> he was the first person to do a blood transfusion in an emergency. On his sister, he gave her his own blood when she was having an intrapartum hemorrhage. He was also very interested in head and neck surgery. And he used to spend the weekends giving himself local anesthetic blocks to try and work out how he could improve his techniques when operating on the head and neck. As a result, he became addicted to cocaine and morphine and depressed. And he disappeared for some 10 years. Now, if you're a depressed alcoholic <coughs> who's a morphine addict and so on and so forth, there's not many things you can do in life, but one is to become a breast disease surgeon. Which is, exactly <laughs> which is ex exactly what Holstead did when he appeared at Johns Hopkins as head of surgery about 1890. <coughs> at that time, he um, at that time he continued his surgical uh, researches. He invented, for example, the rubber glove. But he will be most remembered for two things. One is his work on breast cancer, and the other thing was he'll be remembered for how difficult and awkward a customer he'd actually become. In uh, 1902, the trustees of Johns Hopkins uh, got Singer Sargent, a well-known American portrait painter, to uh, do a <coughs> painting of the four leading doctors at Johns Hopkins. There's Osler there, a man called Welsh, who's a pathologist and so forth. But they decreed that Singer Sargent, when he painted this picture, should use pigments when he was they were painting Holstead, which would fade with time, so that he would disappear off the scene physically as well as mentally. He was very unpopular. The same cannot be so of this other man, colorectal pathologist, you all know, of course, Cuthbert Jukes. He's known, of course, for rectal cancer, but he was also a pathologist at the um, Peter and Paul's Hospital for Urology. And they've done a lot of work on the bacteriology of food, unassuming individual who took the credit for nothing. However, both these two people did very important things because they propagated this concept of sequential spread of cancer, Holstead for the breast and Jukes for rectal cancer, which implied that the tumour started in the primary site and sequentially spread to the regional lymph nodes and eventually to bloodstream. And this philosophy influenced cancer thought <coughs> for doctors for 50 years <coughs> and for many non-specialists and certainly for many members of the public it remains the philosophy that they understand till today. Now nobody questioned this sequential philosophy until this man Trial Jr. Uh, from the Cleveland Clinic wrote a paper in the middle 1960s on a number of patients who had had a Holstead mastectomy who had negative nodes but who had died. And he said, hey, there's something wrong here. Um, <coughs> according to Holstead, if you have negative nodes, you should survive your cancer. And he was obviously politically quite savvy. He didn't write this down. He just mentioned it in a few lectures. It was left, really, to a surgeon from Canada, this man Devitt, who really nobody else has heard of and has written nothing else apart from this paper, who in the Journal of the American uh, Canada, Canadian Medical Association in 1965 actually questioned these philosophies of <coughs> Holstead and to a lesser extent of, um, of, of sequential <coughs> spread. Now this was all very well, but it needed a bit of science behind it. And the science questioning this Holsteadian theory came from this man, Bernard Fisher, who was professor of surgery at uh, Pittsburgh University. <coughs> and Fisher is a bit of a philosopher, but also did a lot of laboratory work. And he showed, for example, that there were communications between afferents and efferents and lymph glands through which uh, uh, tumor cells could go and therefore bypass lymph glands and so forth. 
And he uh, summarized all his thoughts in this famous lecture, Jamie Karnofsky lecture in 1980, where he made a number of uh, important statements. He said that breast cancer was potentially systemic from its inception. Variations in local regional treatment will have no impact on survival. Lymph node involvement represents risk of spread rather than being its determinant. And local recurrence invariably is a reflection of systemic spread rather than its cause. And these are the Fisher Dick tanks. <coughs> the question is, could this be true for the rectal cancer? <coughs> well, what's the view from the outside? My view about rectal cancer, I'm not an expert, read about it in simplistic reviews and so forth. It seems to me that TME was a tremendous concept, adopted quickly, allowed extensive preservation, reduced local recurrence, and probably improved survival, although, as I understand it, there's been no randomized trial of TME against old-fashioned, if you like, rectal excision. I would also say that there's been no variation in surgical treatment of breast cancer that has had such as a dramatic effect as TME has had for rectal cancer. What about adjuvant treatment? Well, here is a mess. <coughs> you have all sorts of protocols and regimes. Radiotherapy, pre-operative, post-operative, short course, long course, different planning techniques. Chemotherapy, again, pre-operative, post-operative, infusions, bolus injections, various regimes, sometimes integrated with chemotherapy, with radiotherapy, sometimes not. And maybe it can reduce local recurrence, but overall, there's not much survival difference with these treatments. And I think when you have this type of issue where there's so many choices, you run into all sorts of problems. And I picked up on this with this NSABP R03 study, which was published only 18 months ago, of preoperative versus postoperative chemo radiation in patients with rectal cancer. And chemotherapy regime was 5-ethylene-leucoborin, and it was initiated in 1996, this trial, and published at the end of 2009. And this is a trial which shows that patients receiving preoperative chemo radiation had an improved disease-free survival. And in terms of meta-analysis, it will go down as that. However, when you look at this, first of all, you find that TME was not actually mandated in 900 patients were planned randomized, and only 267 actually got in the trial. Staging by rectal examination was allowed. Chemotherapy compliance was not recorded. And who now is using a 5 ethylene leucoborin as a preoperative agent? Time to surgery was recommended at six weeks, but not recorded. Local recurrence rate was similar in both arms, but what improved the disease-free survival? So you have a trial like this, which a lot of people have invested a lot of time and effort into, but what's it actually telling you? Probably very, very little indeed. So, <coughs> the questions we might have to ask is, does removal of the lymph nodes improve prognosis? Do they reduce or enhance morbidity when they're removed? Does radical removal <coughs> of lymph nodes indicate an overall surgical better technique? And I have to say, I think that's very important. I think the type of surgeon who does a very good TME will do a better anastomosis and search the abdominal wound better. And it's very difficult sometimes to distinguish between surgical technique producing good results and the actual uh, pathophysiology in the technique involved. Is harm done by removing normal nodes? How do you determine nodal stages? routine histology, cytology, mm -hmm. immunochemistry, cytogenetics. And having determined the status, mm -hmm. how do you treat nodes? And if you use chemotherapy and radiotherapy, what does it mean if a node is rendered sterile and it appears as a small fibrous ball on a scan? Is there any activity in that gland? Can it produce further trouble? Or is it really sterilized for the long term? We don't know the answer to many of these questions. Now, rectal and breast cancer do have one thing in common, and that is that both of the, these organs have a pathway of lymphatic drainage out with the normal surgical block section. 
the rectum, it's along the middle rectal arteries, from the vessels to the pelvic side wall, to the breast, it's to the internal mammary glands. And you can get involvement in both these sites, and as recurrence is shown here, the left pelvic side wall, and the right with the arrow internal mammary nodes after treatment of cancer in these positions. Now, what do we know about internal mammary glands? Well, we know that they're positive in up to 25% of patients. We know that 15% of patients with internal mammary positivity have negative axillary glands. We know that positivity is a poor prognostic sign. But we've had three randomized surgical trials evaluating their excision, which showed no advantage in survival. And currently, there's a trial of adjuvant radiation, which is recruiting badly and is incomplete because of worries of over cardiac toxicity. So despite all this, there's a big question mark about this group of lymph nodes. We know they're there, we know they're positive, we know that they are a core indicator of survival, but we don't know how to treat them, and our treatments so far have failed to demonstrate any ongoing benefit. While we're on this subject of, um, how do I get that on? Um, while we're on the subject of having tumour which you don't know anything about <coughs> and don't know how to deal with, <coughs> here we have this business of micrometastases in bone marrow. These are present in up to 25% of all patients with breast cancer presentation, and I think they're present quite frequently in people with colorectal disease. The publications on this have dried up over the last five or so years because what researchers have seen that it's an absolute cul-de-sac with no clear indication of what, again, these tumor cells mean, how to treat them, and what benefit any treatment might have. So another area of uncertainty. How can you treat the lymphatic field? Well, in breast disease, we've had lots of experience with surgery, with preoperative chemotherapy and postoperative radiation. Not so much with preoperative combined chemo irradiation. And if you look at axillary surgery, with a view to curative intent, we find some very interesting information. Fisher, the chap I showed you earlier from the University of Pittsburgh, who was always against Hofstadian theory, and the MRC here in this country in the middle 1970s, were very bold and set up some randomized trials where patients either had a radical mastectomy or were trialed to have a simple mastectomy with a policy of observation of the axilla, or alternatively a simple mastectomy with blind irradiation to the axilla. It's quite an outward going thing to do at that time in terms of the knowledge of breast cancer as it was. Now about 2005, both these studies produced a 25 year survival data. And there was no difference in outcome in any of the three groups at all. Local recurrence in the untreated group was only about 3.5%. So this was very good evidence indeed that actually surgical excision of these glands did nothing for survival. Dovetailed a bit into the fact that at that time, very long-term survival data for breast cancer was being produced. This data came from Cambridge here in the United Kingdom and when uh, they did the 15-year follow-up of patients with breast cancer, they believed that patients who survived this amount of time were properly cured of their disease because the survival curve of 15 <coughs> years of patients with breast cancer became parallel to the normal population. However, after 20 years or 25 years, you can see this divergence of these lines again. Why was that? Well, some of that was due to the fact that second cancers were occurring in the opposite breast, but it wouldn't account for everything. So you had to actually look at radiotherapy for what might be happening. At the time, radiotherapy <coughs> techniques involved orthovoltage radiation. And when, in 1989 and again in 2001, meta-analyses were done on this orthovoltage radiation in patients with breast cancer, some very peculiar things were actually demonstrated. This meta-analysis was based on about 30,000 patients. In no negative disease, 
There was no difference in survival if you irradiated the breast and axillary area. For no positive disease, there was an even worse prognosis. The overall death rate was worse in irradiated patients. The Scandinavians came up with the results here. <coughs> Reason why. They did some careful studies looking at patients who had been randomized between 1970 and 1980 for radiation or not for 15 year follow up and they found a hazard ratio of 1.3 for myocardial infarction in the irradiated group. So your radiation in these studies could do long term harm which is not apparent for 20 or 25 years after initial treatment. In this particular study of course the increased incidence of myocardial infarction was almost entirely limited to patients with left sided disease. We're now using mega voltage radiation. It's much more sophisticated. Uh, this uh, study hasn't actually been published yet, uh, but this is a meta analysis of <coughs> mega voltage radiation in breast cancer. Again, in 11,000 patients, 17 randomized trials showing a reduction in local recurrence using this technique, and for the first time ever, a slight improvement in survival with radiotherapy data. However, this is for 15 years of follow-up, and as I say, 11,000 patients. Chemotherapy and endocrine treatment. <coughs> the main trial, again, came from the United States, preoperative versus postoperative chemotherapy, the regime adriamycin cyclophosphamide. And uh, you'd think there was only one survival curve here. In fact, there are two. And up to 10 years now, the data shows absolutely no difference in overall survival between the two. However, what is important is the pathologic data from this. Because patients who had preoperative chemotherapy had a significantly less incidence of nodal positivity in the specimen. However, this didn't have any effect on prognosis. What this study also showed, importantly, was that the response in the primary tumor correlated with survival. And I think this is the first surgical oncology trial which really demonstrated that. The red line were patients who had a complete pathologic response, the yellow line, a partial response, the white line, no response to have no response in the pathologic specimen is a very bad prognostic sign. To have a complete pathologic response is an excellent sign. And that now can be used as a surrogate for survival. If you up the chemotherapy, you give in more aggressive regimes, here using Taxol, the effects are enhanced. But again, there doesn't seem to be any improvement in overall survival in all the patients treated. The ones who get the benefits are the ones who get the complete pathologic response. If you get a complete pathologic response, can you abandon the surgery? There's been one trial from the Royal World Marsden that tried that and they bottled out because of local recurrence problems. I heard Walmart talk a year or so ago about rectal cancer and he was suggesting that patients who had complete responses to chemo radiation <coughs> and rectal cancer may in fact have a policy of wait and watch and see what happens, and I don't know whether you would agree with that or not. But it's never been actually trialed in breast disease. If you do meta-analysis of pre versus post-operative chemotherapy, it's now available. 14 randomized trials, data out last year. Pre-operative chemotherapy, better tolerated than post-operative chemotherapy. I think we'd all accept that. Again, we cannot, with 15 years of follow-up, lots of patients, lots of trials, show any difference in survival. We do downstage, but that downstaging is associated with more local recurrence. And that is absolutely clear data. It mustn't be put into a false sense of security about downstaging. Endocrine treatment is pretty hopeless. I'm only mention it to dismiss it. So after 40 years in breast disease, what have we shown? Well, the treatment of regional nodes per se has had little impact on survival. It does stage the disease. The more you look for lymphatic metastases, the more you'll find them. The significance of, say, finding a few isolated tumor cells in lymph nodes is unclear. 
but there is data to suggest that their presence is a poor prognostic sign in the very long term. We have new methods of identifying positive nodes. And I'm not sure whether this is applicable to uh, colorectal cancer, but this is called the Kepik Gene Expert System. Uh, it's a polymerase chain reaction to identify <coughs> nucleic acid sequences. You have this bit of kit in the theater or nearby theater. The lymph node you remove at the time surgery is put into it, and it comes up with a graph to tell you whether the node is positive or not. Very useful, because then you can go ahead and do your surgery. Frozen section has only got a 50 or 60% correlation with HNE. In print cytology, about the same. <coughs> correlation with this machine seems to be of the order of 95%. If anything, it's a bit too sensitive. We know that preoperative treatment downstage <coughs> doesn't improve survival, and that downstaging may lead to more local occurrence. It's unclear that surgery is required after a complete response. I think there are many parallels here with rectal cancer. However, we have reduced the mortality of breast cancer significantly in this country and throughout the world. The main effect is probably because of tamoxifen. As far as colorectal surgery is concerned, I have to say I think colorectal cancer follows Holsteinian principles much more than other tumors. I think you can learn something by looking at allied subjects to see what the experience is there. And I think we'll be very skeptical of the oncologic claims of chemotherapists and radiation oncologists. Lymphadenectomy, I don't think there is much evidence that it per se will improve survival but a good associated surgical technique that goes with a good lymphadenectomy will reduce local recurrence and therefore benefit the patient. Advances in treatment for high-stage disease will eventually translate to less advanced cases, and this will be important for you as you see more Duke's A cases in screening programs. Complete response rate is a surrogate for survival, New drugs are always coming along, and breast disease, they suddenly hit you like nothing on earth, and everything changes within six or nine months. And then there is the new biology, microarray gene profiling. And currently, we're doing a study where we're taking tumor from the primary uh, growth, doing sentient gene profiling on it to determine whether in the long run we can predict which patients will relapse, either at local or distant sites. And I think that's all I've got to say to you, and thank you very much indeed for listening.